Well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's very pleasing to be here. Um, I love lecture theatres. My background before politics was actually as a Crown prosecutor and as a um, legal academic. So I lectured um, Evidence and Criminal Law 100. So it's a bit familiar being here, except that you're all much better dressed, actually, than my students ever were. And most of you look like you're awake, which is also much, much improved from lecturing at University of Western Australia. And look, let me state at the outset that having worked in the, in the criminal law as a Crown Prosecutor for a long time and a legal academic, I spent about 10 years um, inside this environment where um, you use evidence to meet certain standards of proof. And in the legal system, as you'd all be roughly familiar with from watching TV, there are three basic standards of proof. There's the criminal standard beyond reasonable doubt. There's an intermediary standard, which is a high likelihood which is also used sometimes in criminal matters. And then there's the civil standard, which is balance of probabilities. And balance of probabilities is simple enough, as I'd always explained to my students, that's just a 50 plus 1% probability that something is true. Um, a high likelihood is something substantially above 51%, but less than beyond reasonable doubt. And whenever you would explain this to students, they would always ask the logical question, well, if balance of probabilities is 51% and high likelihood is above that but beyond, beneath beyond reasonable doubt, well then what is it beyond reasonable doubt? And the unfortunate answer is that there is no answer to what beyond reasonable doubt is. And in fact, the rule that um, exists in the criminal law is that if a judge ever gets into the mess of trying to explain to a jury what beyond reasonable doubt is, it's almost certain that the trial will either abort or be the subject of a successful appeal because it's just beyond explanation. But it always sits in the back of my head, and when I came in to inherit the government's deregulation agenda, I always had beyond reasonable doubt sitting in the back of my mind. And I'm going to give you a, a brief presentation. It's actually a 45-minute presentation condensed into about 20 minutes, so we'll race through it. But um, having inherited the deregulation agenda of the government that was previously run by Josh Frydenberg before he was promoted to assistant treasurer, I think it's... It's true beyond reasonable doubt, based on all the evidence I've seen, to say this, that in 2015 there will be less federal regulation in the Australian economy than there was in 2014. So to restate that, the stock of federal regulation measured by its cost on the economy has decreased this year compared to last. I'm certain of that beyond reasonable doubt. I think it's highly likely that this is the first time that there has been a downturn in the amount and cost of federal re regulation in the economy in several decades, perhaps ever. Now, restating that, it's highly likely that it's the first time in our history that any federal government has put in place a concerted enough plan to actually reverse the trend to the growth in cost in regulation. Now, the reason I can be sure beyond reasonable doubt that it has decreased, but only certain to a high likelihood that it's the first time that it's ever been decreased is because of this remarkable fact. And that is that until this government came into power, Australia had no accurate measure of the total cost of the stock of Commonwealth regulation, and it had no complete accurate measure of how much was being added to the cost of regulation or how much was being subtracted from the total stock of regulation in any given year. And I actually think that is completely astonishing, that in 100 years we've never kept accurate tabs on the complete stock of regulation and how much is going in and how much is going out in any given year. So to explain why we got ourselves into that situation and what the Coalition's doing about it, I'm just going to look at three things. First, why is there a problem with the levels of regulation in Australia? So, if you like, why would we want to put so much effort into trying to reduce red tape? Secondly, how is the coalition going about the task of reducing red tape? So what's the process to regulatory reduction? And third, what have we managed to achieve so far? So first, why is there a problem? Why are we putting so much effort into reducing red tape? And I think that the basic answer is because we're highly suspicious of the fact that red tape has grown unabated every single year since Federation. No different from academics. We can't work the slideshow. Am I green to move ahead? Yep. There we go. This is a um, graph that was put together by Deloitte in a, in a review about regulation. What that tracks is the growth in the volume of pages of regulation at the federal level since Federation. And as you will see, the growth is absolutely remarkable. 
Um, now, looking at regulation by pages is instructive, absolutely, but it's not um, completely informative. And the reason why it's not completely informative is that um, the really best measure of regulation is not the sheer volume of pages, which you can see has grown very substantially, but it's how much does it cost to comply with the, the regulation that exists in an economy. And in fact, Deloitte's have also got a very interesting second slide, which hopefully will come up. There we go. Um, so what we've got there is the rise of compliance culture. That measures the number of um, workers in the Australian workforce whose jobs is to comply with regulation, over time, obviously. Um, and Deloitte's have estimated that 8.9 hours a week um, middle managers are spending on red tape compliance and that one in every 11 employed Australians now works in the compliance sector. And I might just point out here that um, the Commonwealth over 100 years has been completely guilty of increasing regulation year on year unabated. Um, however, uh, we're not the only culprits. There's obviously local and state government who are responsible as well. And one of the other things that Deloitte's measured and noticed was that a lot of um, corporations, companies, large organisations impose a great deal of regulation on themselves, completely outside of what government does. For any of you who have ever worked for a university, you will absolutely know this to be true. Uh, I had a conversation with senior managers at BHP and they said that what they are trying to do internally is very similar to what the government is trying to do externally. Again, the reason why measuring just the sheer volume in pages isn't terribly accurate is that legislation um, grows in primary, regulation grows in primary legislation, in subordinate legislative instruments, what we might call regulations, but also in what we'll call quasi-regulations, which is basically a whole range of administrative actions, rules, forms, requirements, the sort of things that grow up at the department level which are either based on laws or are based merely on administrative actions and decisions and powers that the departments have got. So when you measure by volume, as Deloitte's have done, you don't account for the great cost that can be occasioned um, through a whole range of administrative decisions at the departmental level that don't actually rely on an act or have their genesis in some act. So, I mean, just to give you an example, one of the achievements of the coalition since coming to government was through fixing a form. And um, the coalition achieved $156 million in compliance cost savings by looking at a simplified income tax return lodgement system through the MyTax website so that if you automatic, so that the income parts of the application, so of the tax return, are pre-populated based on last year's form. And that affects every individual in Australia who uses that form, which is a great many of them, and we calculated that that will save, in terms of the time cost of compliance, $156 million a year. So by fixing a form, or indeed getting rid of a form, you can save massive amounts of compliance cost and time in the Australian economy. And of course, another problem with just measuring pages in that Deloitte's graph is that sometimes very small acts will have a very large compliance cost. Sometimes very large acts will have a very small compliance cost. Um, just a little interesting example, the Coalition, as part of this agenda, got rid of the Sea Installations Levy Act and amended the Sea Installations Act 1987. I doubt that any of you would have heard of those acts necessarily, but what those acts did was um, have permit and levy processes for the installation of pontoons and artificial islands. We worked out that there was already um, a duplicate system, that there were two systems for pontoons and artificial islands. We got rid of one and it had a very modest um, compliance cost saving for 10 different operators um, up at the Great Barrier Reef of about five and a half thousand dollars in compliance costs a year. But it was worth the effort even though it's modest because these things all add up. Whereas with the mining tax, uh, which the coalition has obviously repealed, there were fewer than 20 entities that actually ended up paying for the mining tax. There were 125 entities who had to go through the compliance process of showing that they did not have to pay. And we calculated that those, those organisations, 
were um, having compliance costs of around $10.3 million a year to comply to show that they didn't need to pay. So by getting rid of the mining tax, we completely eliminated those compliance costs. So um, to be able to reduce the cost of legislation, the starting point for the coalition has been to institute a methodology. Uh, we needed to be able to accurately measure the total cost of the total stock of Commonwealth regulation. Uh, and we then needed to do a proper methodology of the measurement of what was going in and what was coming out. Now, um, that stock take, the results of that are going to be announced in two weeks' time in our third repeal day. Uh, so I can't give you the results of that today, but let me say it's the first time in the history of, Com of the Commonwealth Government that we actually know what the cost of our total stock of legislation, regulation and administrative decisions is, which is quite a remarkable thing. Um, for the present purposes, let me say that that total stock of regulatory cost was very, very large indeed. And just again, um, this is again from a Deloitte's um, paper. They estimated that comparatively the percentage of compliance costs as a percentage of GDP in Australia is about 4.2%, which compares rather unfavourably to Belgium, Denmark and the Netherlands. 4.2% um, of GDP each year is chewed away in the compliance costs with regulation. As to why we would try and decrease the regulatory stock and cost of compliance, if we assume, which I think it's very safe to assume, that Australia has a lot of regulation, that doesn't itself perfectly answer the question why we would try and reduce it. And I think the answer why we try and reduce the regulatory compliance burden is that regulation is a problem that creates a problem. And the problem that regulation creates is a productivity decline problem. And productivity decline is not monocausal. There are lots of different things that contribute to productivity decline. It's kind of a monster that has several parents. But a big part of productivity decline in Australia has been over-regulation. And there's a couple of ways in which you can measure uh, productivity decline. There was recently a World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Ranking Report. Um, and it's interesting to look at how that report looked at Australia's global competitiveness in two years, between 11, 12 and 12, 13. And during those two years, Australia remained in the same position, but it had been decreasing over the previous six years. And it's likely we remained in the same position because we were at the, the tail end of the super cycle on resources commodities pricings during that period. But in one year between 11, 12 and 12, 13, out of 144 nations, on the burden of government regulation, we slumped from 60th to 96 out of 144. That is a very significant downturn in terms of our productivity as measured in the area of the regulatory burden. You'll see there that represents it graphically. So there's our rank at the top and there's our declining position in terms of the burden of regulation. So that, that global competitiveness report is a very comprehensive assessment of international competitiveness. It is based on perceptions of, of organisations, entities and companies that respond to it. So it's not perfect, but it's very illustrative of the fact that productivity decline is real. And a big part of that is if you are over-regulating yourself, if your government is over-regulating your economy. Now, please don't run out of the room screaming. No tests or anything afterwards. There's two basic measures of productivity. Uh, the first is labour productivity, which um, is just at the top there, and that's just the um, total output of GDP divided by the total productive hours. So you're measuring how productive every unit of labour is in the economy. So China is um, somewhere less than 25% as productive as the United States, but could well become a bigger economy than the United States because they have four times as many people. The second more complicated uh, equation there is what's known as multi-factor productivity or total factor productivity. And that's a slightly more complicated concept, but in course summary, it just means how much more can an economy produce with a given set of inputs? So if you have no new capital and no new labour, how do you increase your productivity? And what multi-factor productivity represents is an output growth which is not accounted for by growth in input. So it kind of measures 
technological innovation, organisational innovation, workplace innovation and, and also regulatory innovation. If you have fixed amounts of capital and labour but you deregulate, there is a good chance that you will help grow your multi-factor productivity. And it's argued to be very important. Most economists will say that probably 60% of a nation's productivity growth and economic growth is accounted for by multi-factor productivity growth. Now, very unfortunately in Australia, over recent times, and we would argue under the previous government particularly, the growth in multi-factor productivity in Australia was in decline. So the Economist Intelligence Unit ranked Australia the second worst of 51 countries for multi-factor productivity growth. We scored on a scale of 100 points, 10.3, You'll see there that of the 51 countries, we were um, behind Uganda for multi-factor productivity growth. Uh, happily, we were just in front of Botswana, who was last with zero points out of 100. But that is not a very attractive picture. And at the time this um, report came out, I recall uh, the then Treasurer, Wayne Swan, basically saying, and I'll quote him, our productivity levels in this country are very high on international standards in the top dozen around the world. Now that's true enough, except that the fact that productivity has been relatively high in total in recent times isn't the key question. The question is how is your growth in productivity performing comparative to other nations? Because if you have productivity growth, particularly on multi-factor productivity, which is um, slowing or reversing compared to other nations, then you can fall down the rankings of international productivity very, very quickly. What you do not want to be in is a situation where you're like an AFL coach saying, you know, we've lost the first seven games of this season, but don't worry, we're in the top eight last year. You have to always be ensuring that your multi-factor productivity growth is keeping pace with international standards. You'll see, just interestingly, that that same survey had for our general economic performance at the end of the previous government, we were ranked at 34. Um, we were behind both Colombia and New Zealand. I think, personally, I can accept being behind Colombia, but I can't accept being behind New Zealand, particularly not after that, after that cricket loss recently. Very difficult. So that is why we have to look at regulation. The second question is how do we um, have a reduction in red tape? Like, how do you actually achieve a reduction in red tape? Well, if you go back to that distinction between multi-factor productivity and labour productivity, it demonstrates a very important point. And that is that the first way in which you can increase your productivity, looking at labour productivity, is invest in infrastructure. Um, if you invest in infrastructure, technology and education, your labour will become more productive and as an economy you will become more productive. And I'd pause at this point to say that I think one of the reasons why, and perhaps that's not expressed enough in the media, about why the deficit and debt problem that we inherited is such a problem, is that if you are, as we are now, paying $1 billion in interest a month to service our borrowings, that is dead money that goes overseas that would otherwise be able to be invested by the government in education, in infrastructure and in technology, the things that grow your productivity. Um, in my observation, the, the pointiest end of the problem of debt and deficit is the completely wasteful nature of the interest payments. And if you let those get out of control, as a government and as a nation, you will seriously limit your ability to grow your productivity. Because spending government money wisely on technology, education and infrastructure is a central way to grow your productivity. But of course, the second way to grow your productivity, if you look at multi-factor productivity growth, is to do things better, um, tax better, ensure that the quality of government regulation and spending is better, and of course, reduce the total compliance cost of your regulation. And in one sense, reducing regulation is a budget neutral way of increasing productivity because you are not actually spending money. That does not to say, that is not to say that reducing the regulatory stock is easy, it is very, very difficult, and you have to do certain things. The first thing on how we're dealing with this problem is that we are instituting and sticking to a proper process. So we've set ourselves as the coalition a target of $1 billion net reduction in compliance cost of regulation each year. 
And obviously to meet that target, we need to have a clear understanding of what's going in, what's going out, and how much it's all costing. The centrepiece of that, that process is what we call a regulatory impact statement process. Everything that increases or decreases the cost of compliance of regulation in Australia has to have a regulatory impact statement. That is whether it goes to Cabinet or not. The process has been strengthened by this government to allow for greater consultation with industry. The rules are, and they are strictly applied, that there must always be a non-regulatory option which is, which is considered. We will only ever accept the option with the highest net benefit. We have put specific deregulation units into each of the Commonwealth government departments. And very importantly, and again this is quite astonishing, for the first time ever, there is a thoroughgoing and consistent and accurate measure of the cost that regulatory impact has on individual Australians. Previously, the measure centred around entities such as businesses large and small, but not individuals. So we now have a proper measure of that. The other very important thing we've done, as well as instituting this process, is we've actually stuck to it. So you'll see there there's a measurement of whether a regulatory impact statement is compliant or non-compliant. Uh, in 13-14, there was only one that was non-compliant, and that was a hangover from the previous government. So we've had a 100% success rate on being compliant with our own systems designed to slow regulatory growth. The other good measure is there's a thing known as a Prime Minister's exemption. Every now and then, the Prime Minister uh, can use, if you like, a wild card to put something through Cabinet without a regulatory impact statement. In our first year of government, that happened once, but you'll see that quite remarkably, over the previous six years, there was an enormous number of regulatory impact statements on very big regulatory measures that were granted a prime ministerial exemption, so just sailed through without any measure. And that's why we couldn't, couldn't work out whether um, and by how much the stock of regulation was increasing, because a whole range of things were just being essentially waved through. So the coalition's 100% compliant, the former government had 27 prime ministerial exemptions, 14 were granted in 2010-11 alone. So that's the process we've put in place, which leads me to the final point, uh, which is this, what's been achieved so far. Two weeks' time we're having our third repeal day. Repeal days involve an omnibus repeal day bill, an amending acts repeal bill and a statute law repeal day as well as actually cutting through that massive volume of, of regulation that exists in acts and regulations of federal parliament, they are meant to institute a culture where twice a year we, we announce in a transparent and clear way what the actual reduction to the cost of the stock has been. Now, not everything we get rid of has a compliance cost reduction. Uh, to give you an example, the oldest act that we've repealed so far was the Defence Act 1904. So old and so overtaken and historic was the Defence Act 1904 that it had a whole range of um, references to the state division of naval forces. Like it dated to a time when it was contemplated that the states would have their own navies. So we got rid of it because it was no longer required. Although I must say my old boss, Colin Barnett, I'm not quite sure whether he was exactly thrilled at the fact that he could no longer potentially have a navy, but nevertheless, it's gone. And these repeal days are absolutely critical for this process of measuring in a transparent way what's going in, what's coming out. This just shows you the costing process. We measure three things, delay costs, substantive costs and administrative costs. And essentially, if I can summarise it this way, every single regulatory measure is broken down into activity points. So what we are looking for is a single point of interaction with a single human being or a single business or a single corporation where some person or some entity is required to do something. And once we find that inside the legislation, we calculate how many FTEs are going to be required to do that thing for how many hours a week and what is the value of their time. And it's a very thoroughgoing and sophisticated way of using what they call a business cost calculator to measure the regulatory effect. We also measure delay costs. It's just an example. I asked the department to find an example. They did manage to find the most boring example in the entire regulatory stock, so I might try and find a more interesting example. But 
This is the total regulatory impacts of a safety rehabilitation and compensation act. I suppose it's not boring if you were paying um, in excess of $30 million to comply with it, but basically it allowed organisations who had to insure themselves in two different states, in two jurisdictions, to go straight into the Commonwealth system and only have to insure themselves once. This is just showing you how we measured delay costs. There was a very significant reform, reform for environmental approvals, one-stop shop for environmental approvals. The approvals are basically undertaken by state civil servants pursuant to the criteria of both the state and federal act, saving a duplicate process. We went through all of the big projects that were affected or would have been affected by this in the recent, recent past, looked at their discount rates they were at, at a nominal 7% how much the net present value of the project was and how many days we would save by the new process. And then using that retrospective analysis, we, we undertook a prospective analysis to calculate the savings for what we expect will be projects into the future. And we calculated that, that will save the economy $417 million a year in savings by shortened periods of approval processes, by getting rid of delay. So what have we achieved? The, the pie graph at A is minus the pie graph at B, which produces the pie graph at C. And there's always regulation coming on, as there is coming off. The pie graph at A under this government must always be bigger than the pie graph at B so that we have a net reduction. But what we've achieved is over 400 decisions um, with an impact of less than 10 million per year. So 400 smaller decisions which percolate down throughout the whole economy and there have been 38 decisions with an impact of more than 10 million per year. And what all that adds up to is around about $2.1 billion worth of compliance and delay and administrative cost savings to the Australian economy. And that is why, as I opened up with, I can say beyond reasonable doubt that there is now a lower compliance cost of regulation this year than there was last. And I'm fairly certain, to a high degree of likelihood, that that's the first time that that has happened in a long time, if ever, in the Australian economy. The very interesting thing about all of this is it will have a um, recurrent effect. So that $2.1 billion worth of decisions, which affect $2.1 billion worth of savings, when they get better down into the economy, they will be better down in 2015, and then they will repeat every year. And our $1 billion promise, uh, our $1 billion target is a fresh target, a fresh net target every year. So it will sit on top of the achievements from the previous year. So that if a regime like this is able to continue for a long time, which I truly hope it does, you have the ability to build up a very substantive compliance cost savings in the economy through getting rid of regulation. Finally, there's just some examples of some of the bigger ticket items where we've managed to have some very significant savings. One-stop shops, streamlining tax returns, reforms to support responsible gambling, improving fair work laws, all of these are having very big economic effects. And there have been a number, of course, in the area of agriculture. So I hope that gives you a broad overview of what the government's program is. I hope it gives you a sense that it is actually a program that's doing something that really hasn't been done before in a concerted way, that it's very, very good for the economy. And I was asked what my ambition for the program of deregulation is, as well as saving massive amounts for the economy, I'd like there to be so much confidence in what's being done that there's truly and ultimately a bipartisan agreement that this sort of program should keep going in Australia essentially forever. Um, there'll always be regulation, but the trick is to make sure that you are consistently reducing the stock to save the economy money and increase productivity. Thanks very much for your time this morning, and I think that we're happy to take some questions straight away.